my honor and pleasure to serve as the moderator of the roundtable discussion this morning. I'm joined here on stage with four colleagues who you'll get to know uh, a little bit better in a few minutes. Next, after a uh, brief introduction, we'll hear uh, the, or my introduction. We'll hear introductions from our uh, panelists, as I said, Jules Rochelle Sievert, John Tversky, David East, and Erica Halverson. At that point, we intend to engage in a discussion to reflect and expand on Erica's keynote address last night about the roles of the arts, arts pedagogy, the arts in education, and the arts in society through generative, collaborative conversation. So, you know, 90 minutes should give us enough time to cover all of that. In the final part of our session, we intend to open up this space for questions and discussion from you to do the same with us. Artist Jasper John summarized his art practice methodology in three phrases. Take an object, do something to it, do something else to it. Much like thrown and altered pots, additive sculpture and raku firing, some forms of art practice situate the process of making central to the work. We saw that approach at play at last night, but not through the materials of encaustic print or found objects like John's uses. Instead, Erica's keynote address on the role of the arts, the role the arts play in transforming education uh, by pedagogy of improvisation provided us with the first of the three objects, if you will. Following Erica's address, Vanessa German provided an electrifying performance as an embodied invitation for us to consider the role of the arts in society, perhaps in ways some of us previously had not. The order of the two presentations last night could not have been situated better. The four key features of improv outlined by Erica's talk, informed by her girl, Tina Fey, and central to her presentation were yes, yes and, make statements, and no mistakes, opportunities. They offered us methodology, a worldview, and pedagogical model as a set of lenses through which we can, in Erica's words, reframe teaching and learning, as well as a way to, for us to view Vanessa German's performance. This set of lenses through which we could do something to, do something with, or do something in response to Vanessa's performance, and I would argue to other works of art and educational experiences among learners and teachers. That is, we could see moments of yes, yes and, making statements and opportunities rather than mistakes in that performance and in classrooms and in studio experiences. I imagine this morning we'll hear about other specific examples of arts pedagogy and learning to place in relationship with those four features. In response, and it, as John's methodology might anticipate in our roundtable discussion this morning, we offer that third do something to that object in our series. Erica's three questions offered us a way to resist the instrumentalization of the arts and the STEM monster, as she calls it, for the purpose of serving what I call the other core subjects. Now that we have taken Erica's address and done something to it, and done something else to it, this morning is where we will do something else to it again. With me on the round table this morning are Erica Halverson, our keynote speaker. She needs no introduction. Jules Rochelle Sievert, an artist embedded in a law school in Boston, whose work takes on the spaces of the urban environment as context medium, muse, and purpose for the art practice and social engagement work that she does. David East, whose work as a ceramic artist and college educator in Baltimore is committed to exploring the relationships among learners, educational and other institutions, and the social spaces they inhabit. And John Tversky, a high school art teacher from outside Philadelphia, embodies the reflective practitioner who learns daily from his students about the challenges of navigating curricular demands, contemporary technologies, expectations of learning, and a culture of high stakes tests and accountability. So without further delay, here are the panelists. Good morning, folks. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your morning to join us today. My name is Jules Rochelle Sievert. I'm a socially engaged practitioner 
I'm a legal educator and I am an arts educator. Um, five years ago, I moved to Boston, Massachusetts from Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, I was working on a public art commission. Um, and as part of that public art commission, um, I was also serving um, 400 elementary school students in the community of Garfield. Um, and uh, this elementary school had no arts education for four years. So as part of my commission, um, I then used, you know, I hired art educa educators to go into work into that school and did the kind of public commission. But that was a pivotal moment in my career um, that led me to combine uh, my interest in social advocacy and um, social practice. So I moved to Boston where they had this unique opportunity um, to, for me to work as an artist inside of a public interest law school. So I've been there for five years. Um, it's taken five years to be able to transform um, the legal environment, but also to work within this context of the city. Um, so now we have this very unique project called Stable Ground Boston. Um, so through the context of the law school, we have created three artist residencies. So we're working with a fabric maker. We are working with um, a, someone who does sculpture, but also considers the sort of activism in her neighborhood of Dorchester the social engagement practice in the community building within the Vietnamese community as her practice. So she has a project called Dot Not For Sale. Um, and then we are working with a dancer. So, um, so we've combined these sort of practitioners with legal advocates, advocates. So three law students have been working with the artists. We've partnered with a domestic violence institute and then a public health policy institute as well as the city of Boston through an organization called um, the Office of Housing Stability. So what we're trying to do is to use the creative process and the community building process that happens through the arts to learn something about the neighborhood and then to inform the city about the traumas of the neighborhood, to inform the way the city communicates with the neighborhood. So that project is called Stable Ground Boston. Thanks, Jules. John? Um, John Torsky, uh, as was presented by Stephen, I'm a high school teacher outside of Philadelphia in Bucks County. I teach uh, mainly ceramics, uh, 9 through 12. The empty chairs reminds me of my first period class, which starts at 725. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, I've been working in ceramics for about 25 years. Um, very blessed, as was sort of implied last night by many of the presenters, um, to have found the world of clay. Uh, it has completely changed my life. And I'm unbelievably honored to be sitting among um, this panel uh, and amongst many of the people I've met at this convention. It's a truly wonderful group. Um, I learn most from my students um, on a good day. Uh, and I think any day that I can learn something new is a, is a great day. So uh, I want to share something with you uh, because I think from the words of the students, it's, it's easily understood. This is from a student uh, I worked with for um, two, two semesters, which is about uh, 18 weeks or so. Um, as a normal part of school life, we as students are expected to follow a set of curriculum and receive a grade based off of being correct and or incorrect. During this course, I learned that there is no right or wrong way to do something. I failed, but I wasn't upset because what this course taught me was how to deal with failure. They don't teach that in English or history class, but here in ceramics, I learned you can't give up. And even if I were not to pursue art in my future, I learned a few irreplaceable life lessons. Um, that's what I try to do with my life. Um, I'm not concerned with what my students make, but what they learn. And it's really important to me, and I try to convey that. The pot that they get out of the kiln is a bonus, right? So uh, I often, when my students say, well, what are we going to make in this class? I say, well, when you go into your math class, do you ever say, what are we making today? I say, what am I learning? Mm -hmm. So I try to um, really convey that to my students. It's a very difficult, difficult task because of expectations. And when we come into a room, we expect to see something. You're all expecting to hear something based on our subject matter. But as Erica pointed out last night, if we start improv and start doing something completely different, some of you <coughs> might be a little bit upset by that. Um, I'm not dancing, if anybody's expecting that. So um, the one thing I was really also really touched by last night is this concept of um, when Erica said that if nobody gets involved, there's no movement. I'm paraphrasing, I apologize, Erica. And um, that was really clear last night w during the performance. Um, what would have happened if 
Nobody came up on stage when somebody was asked to come up who sings. Was she prepared for that? And that's our, that's our daily life as artists and educators. Are we prepared for the un unexpected? You know, what's next? So we can set all the intention that we want, but are we, are we ready for what's not there? And that's being prepared. And ceramics for me has taught me how to deal with that in life um, because life is ever changing. In the education world, I constantly hear, well, things aren't the same, things are changing. Thank God, you know, it's not stagnant and we have to be ready to change. Nothing in my life has taught me that more than ceramics. Um, anybody that has ever touched clay knows that you can make the most beautiful pot and then it may or may not come out the way you expect it. And then if you take it home and you have kids, it's not gonna be lasting much longer. Um, and that's, that's a gift. That's a gift that we don't know about. And, and the last thing I'll say is, um, I tell that to my students all the time is, you may or may not make something in this class and it may or may not last, but what you learn will last forever. Um, I wanted to say uh, thank you all for being here this morning and thanks to Josh Green at Ensika for organizing this. I think it's a really, sorry, I'll move closer. Um, it's a, it, I think it's a really exciting thing to frame, uh, to put education and really kind of, uh, I would say, progressive and revolutionary ideas around education front and center uh, for the NSICA conference. So it's been um, a really exciting start and thank you, Erica, for your work. And I'm really quite honored to be uh, up here with all of these uh, amazing panelists. I do have some notes that I was furiously scrawling last night after responding uh, after thinking about Erica's talk. And one of the things that's been uh, an interesting thing for me and kind of thinking about today and what this uh, um, opportunity for a discussion um, it brings is that uh, I kind of, I went back to uh, a bunch of uh, essays and readings that in many ways formed and helped me organize my own thinking and hopefully action uh, as a teacher uh, early on. And in particular, I went back to an uh, interview between uh, um, David Levi Strauss and Daniel Martinez, uh, in which they <coughs> uh, actively uh, um, are, in many ways, responding to uh, uh, the election of George W. Bush. Uh, so this is a conversation that took place in 2005. And I was thinking a lot about kind of like how uh, that time period is echoed uh, uh, now in, in so many ways. Uh, perhaps uh, a period that seemed so dark now seems light uh, in comparison. Um, and one of the things that was so striking and, and frankly really, really inspiring is the way in which their conversation uh, formed around um, articulating the classroom as one of the last and best places in this country for truly radical thinking to take place, uh, a kind of temporary autonomous zone. And um, I, uh, through coming across that essay, I was awed and inspired to really uh, come into teaching in a different way. And I'm an object maker, I'm definitively an object maker, but I do in many ways have come to think of my teaching as, a, as my social practice. Um, and, uh, and try and, as I've gotten older, maybe try and figure out how to extend the studio in, in all directions in that regard. I think that one of the uh, things that I'm keenly aware of uh, has to do with my own context, which is that I teach at a, a small, private, uh, and very expensive art institute. And so uh, these whole, the whole questions of what your responsibilities are to your students and to the field um, becomes uh, 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 focused through the lens of the institution that you're involved in. Um, one of the things that was really interesting in the group meeting yesterday is, is that many of us kept returning back to uh, John Dewey. Uh, and I thought of this quote to, uh, that Dewey said, to maintain the state of doubt and to carry on systematic and protracted inquiry, these are the essentials of thinking. And just thinking about the ways in which we continue to kind of foster an environment in our classrooms uh, that allow for that to happen. To the STEM monster that Erica framed for us last night, I would add the equally ghoulish assessment monster. 
And it's not by accident that we now face the growing threat of assessment, I think, frankly, flattening the power of the questions we ask mm. in, many, in many cases. Um, we can talk in more kind of complicated timeline in terms of how that, uh, uh, how we've gotten to the point that we're, that we're at in regards to public policy and things like that. And I have panels that, uh, panelists here that would uh, better, um, better support that and probably talk about it at better length. Um, but I think that the things that I've been thinking about is, uh, in regards to this time is how do we continue to make sure that we're supporting young artists uh, to be complainers? Uh, that uh, we need to ask in our classrooms um, if this is the right way, if this is the only way, and continue to kind of look for opportunities for change and real critical and radical thinking. Thanks. Hello again. This is a much more cash environment. I actually like this a lot better. I know it doesn't look very cash because we're sitting at a table, but I feel much more relaxed this morning. Um, so by way of introduction, I thought about <clears throat> maybe saying a few words about a project that I've been working on for the last few years that maybe provides a more direct link um, between the work that I do and the work that goes on um, in the institutions that all the folks at this table uh, participate in and also your own work. Um, so I said, I, you know, I'm an actor and a performing artist, um, but I've spent the past five or six years collaborating with other artist learning scientists, some of whom are visual artists by trade, um, and we have engaged in research on the maker movement and uh, maker spaces around the country that are taking up this challenge of how do we use the creation of things as an opportunity to think about knowing and learning and doing and participating. And I give the same STEM monster talk uh, around the maker community because there is a similar threat, I think, um, in those places to turn making into an instrumental act toward becoming an engineer, becoming a scientist. Um, but working in those spaces has exposed me to a broader range of purposes for creating art. Um, I was saying to this group yesterday, uh, one of my collaborators, a fabulous uh, scholar by the name of Kim Sheridan, who works at George Mason University, and I, um, got the very first National Science Foundation grant to study making and learning. And our partner actually has been the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh um, and the Make Shop. And if you're not from here and you're thinking about things to do while you're here, they have the finest, for my money, um, museum-based makerspace in the country. They've really thought, been thoughtful and careful about how to think about the difference between what it means to spend time in a museum and what it means to spend time in a makerspace and how those two places have um, similar forms and functions but maybe different purposes for uh, the museum attendees, the folks that are there. Um, so I was partnering with Kim and working at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh and because I'm an actor, um, I think in terms of narrative and I think in terms of how artistic representation can function um, in terms of communicating ideas about story. And so early on when Kim and I were framing what we wanted this research project to be about, I kept coming back to this idea that how we would look at learning was based on this trajectory of representation. So that everybody starts out with a story, with an idea, right? And art is about um, using the tools of an artistic medium to represent that story in a way that's um, available to audience members. And that's my history as an artist. It's my history as a studier of art. And Kim, who is a sculptor and a painter, you know, finally said, I can be a little enthusiastic. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, we, can, we should study this. And we need to look at these narrative trajectories. And we need to look at the way kids are represented. And she said, Erica, Erica, not all art is directly representational in the way you want it to be, given 
your focus on storytelling. Um, and so I have come very much to appreciate in the making of objects um, a more complicated relationship between uh, concept and object over time and process. Uh, that is something that I've learned from colleagues like the folks sitting at this table. And I don't have a really big aha on that other than to say that it's challenged my thinking as an artist and therefore challenged my thinking as an educator, right, who is te has tended to frame the work that it is we're doing with learners as a narrative journey. Um, and I still think there's power in that, right? So I don't want to say like, ah, I was wrong, forget that. Um, but I do think that I have a lot more work to do in terms of my understanding of this relationship between concept and object um, and how the understanding of that relationship as a pedagogy is more complicated than I think I was I originally thought. So thank you to Kim and thank you to all of you for um, getting me to think about that. So um, I'm going to use my teacher voice <laughs> or I grow the microphone. <coughs> um, the series of questions that I prepared in advance, I modified that based on Erica's uh, presentation last night and the conversation that the, uh, the panelists, the, the group, uh, had uh, yesterday evening. And um, we could begin in any number of places uh, to provide a, a starting point for this uh, roundtable conversation. And again, I just want to remind you that we'll, be, we'll engage in a conversation here as a roundtable, and then we'll open it up uh, to you all in the, in the um, last uh, bit of the, the session. So uh, because there's so many places to begin, why not begin where uh, I'm going to start now? And uh, you know, in part of your remarks here, Erica, uh, you talked about, you reminded us about um, the instrumental positioning of the arts in relationship to other school subjects. Uh, we can all um, uh, think about how uh, the arts get marginalized in various ways in, in a broader generalized notion of education. Uh, and then the STEM monster comes along that continues to emphasize that. And there's a history of the STEM monster taking different iterations. Um, and then somebody wants to put an A in the middle of it. And to me, that's really strange because for so long you've been kicking the arts to the curb. They're less important. They're not necessary. And now you think the, the frill space, the frill subject, is going to save the more important areas. So can you, you all speak a little bit about this notion of instrumentalizing the arts within relationship to what I call the other core subjects? So I'll, I'll talk for a minute about why art and law, um, but I want to also mention that art and law have never really been separate. If you look at the history of protest and image making within the context of protest and community building or even collective learning and collective thinking. I think there is always this link between the creative process, identity building, uh, uh, transformation, internal transformation, or the transformation of society. So for me, those two uh, fields or ways of thinking about the world or ways of learning about each other have always been linked. Um, but the value I feel over the last five years of being able within the context of law to work with photographers, to work with performance artists, to work with domestic workers, to work with technicians, game designers, um, to see how that's transformed the way future legal educators relate to the world and to the communities that they serve has been incredibly dynamic. So again, uh, for me personally, the fields of art and law are interconnected. Um, the way art and uh, I think personal transformation as it links to restorative justice and how that may empower an individual in terms of building identity and building voice uh, is linked. Um, the, well, I'm, I'm uh, one of the things that I'm quite blessed by is that I teach at the Maryland Institute College of Art and uh, Previous to that, I taught at the University of Missouri Columbia, which was a fantastic place to teach, but um, we were constantly fighting for the, sorry, we were constantly fighting for the legitimacy uh, of the art department within that context. Mm -hmm. 
And, and everything that uh, I was aware of that we had to do was about framing our conversation in through the lens of the broader research uh, mm -hmm. uh, university. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily a problematic relationship, but I saw the problems in it at the University of Missouri. The, at the Maryland Institute College of Art, we start with art first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that has its own problems uh, as well. But I think that one of the things that uh, is, uh, is amazing <coughs> is to just be in this kind of space where everything is seen through that lens um, in relationship to all other kinds of things. Uh, being positioned in Baltimore is also an amazing thing for the institution and the responsibility that we have to that city that is a constantly uh, a struggle that we have to kind of engage with mm -hmm. really powerfully. I, I also can't, I also feel like I should do due diligence to my own position and background as a ceramic artist and to just kind of uh, mention that in many ways ceramics as a field has been instrumentalized. Um, so historically the way in which ceramics has been framed as being in service uh, mm -hmm. of something else mm -hmm. uh, is, an, uh, is a complication that I think people at NSEEK are quite aware of. And I would argue that in many ways that's something that the field can take advantage of, which is, is that our identity is, is uh, dynamic uh, in relationship to other things. Uh, we exist uh, as this beautiful kind of entrance point for people who haven't had any experience making before. We're a highly technical field at the same time. We are uh, in white box gallery and uh, um, the first uh, material that a kid engages with uh, in order to uh, kind of explore, well, maybe after crayons, uh, in order to explore image making. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so although that really, really diverse kind of uh, way in which ceramics frames itself can be difficult to identify in some, uh, in some ways as a distinct field, mm -hmm. uh, it also asserts its distinctness in relationship to other things. So I think that that's, that's, an, that's something that I think about in regards to this question. Right. Um, I, I guess when I think about when you say the other or the core subject matters, yeah. um, I, I'm thinking about my, my class as a, a sign of, a, you know, art has always been a reflection of what's going on in society at a, at a time. And I really look a lot about what's going on with younger <clears throat> kids at this time. So kids that are coming out of high school, what are the trends right now? And um, there's a lot of very alarming statistics that are coming up with mental health, um, you know, anxiety, social anxiety, um, you know, what are the causes for it? And so I think that the art, the art room has always been for some kids a safe place and uh, the academics have always been a place for some other people that learned a specific way, more, uh, you know, people that were better off or, or took advantage of learning maybe not so much kinesthetically or tactilely or um, visually. And I think that other group might be switching. I think that because of, um, we talked a lot about uh, the machine that's in your pocket, the, the phone, um, the addiction of technology, and um, the way people are responding to learning, I think that there are more and more people that are, more and more students, I shouldn't say people, more and more younger kids that might be learning through doing. And I, I sense that there's a reach out from the policymakers to say we need to fix something. Mm -hmm. They're seeing some trends. You know, the, the, the amount of students that are missing school through anxiety, the amount of students that are dropping out of school through addiction, um, it is a much younger rate, and I'm, I would imagine that they're seeing it at the collegiate level as well. Uh, so I think that they're also trying to find ways to connect to the other learner. You, you know, it, it used to be that the arts were marginalized because they, re they only reached the small amount. And um, it's possible that in education, they're realizing that that other amount is shrinking. Um, so that's my guess, okay. I, I, I don't know. I think it's really important for me to say, and, and I don't know if this is the context, that one of the things that's really super important as an educator that doesn't happen is to give our students voice. And 
I think that what I've seen is, you know, again, I, I respond with my students' statements. And when a student says to me uh, a statement of, well, what do you expect? I can't answer that question. I'm a product of 12 years of being told what to do. Uh, that speaks volumes to me. That student doesn't have a voice. And the arts may be that opportunity to give them a voice. And so they may see that, the policymakers may see that as an opportunity. Okay. Not, not a mistake, but an opportunity. An opportunity. Right? Yeah. Uh, and related to that, you know, I think the rhetorical shift that, that we need to make is shifting from thinking of the arts as a privilege to the arts as a right. And what I mean by that is in, in mostly in formal schooling, right, the arts are the thing you get to do when you finish all the stuff that you have to do. Um, and that's true for littles, it's true for older students. Um, and I, I've started to wander into um, a pr previously uncharted territory for me, which is compulsory summer school, um, to try to look at what is happening with our students who we've identified as struggling the most. And it turns out, this may not come as a surprise to you, that summer school pedagogy has historically been slowly and more loudly. Yeah. <laughs> so rather than doing something different, right, the idea is, oh, did you miss that the first time? Here. Let me give it to you again. And for my money, uh, that doesn't seem like a winning strategy. It seems like a, a, a different way would be to say, kind of to John's point, so if this way of thinking about these ideas didn't work for you, how about a different way? Um, and I would like us to no longer think that making stuff is what you get to do once you've passed through whatever it is we've decided is, is the thing that has to be done. Yeah. Um, and I think related to your original question where you said, you know, we drop the A in there, and I think what you meant by that, right, is there's a lot of conversation about moving from STEM to STEAM, mm -hmm. i.e. putting the arts in STEM. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that can have a, what I call like a put a bird on it effect. <laughs> Right, which is like, oh, you want to put in the arts? Just put a bird on it. Um, and while there's potential delight in that, which I appreciate, right? I appreciate the whimsy of saying, look, science and engineering and mathematics doesn't have to be so serious all the time. I totally uh, like that as a way in. I don't think it gets to this core set of ideas that, that we're all alluding to, which is that making art is not just um, the thing that allows us to have joyful access to the stuff that really matters, um, but instead is in and of itself a way of knowing and doing that fundamentally matters. Yeah, yeah. so if I could pick up on that, you know, um, one of the ways that um, I, I've been thinking for many years, um, decades maybe at this point, uh, about the arts is, um, you know, it's a way of knowing about the world, making sense of the world, asking questions about the world, uh, responding to the world in ways that other modes of knowledge construction and inquiry don't allow and perhaps shouldn't in some instances, right? So for that um, uh, framework for me, or that framework for me has been quite helpful in making arguments or discussions with, with folks. I like to, to kind of push this notion of the instrumentalization and the policy issue and the conversation a little bit more and then we can shift to something else. Um, but this idea that you brought up, Eric, about language, right? We need to shift the conversation, shift the language. Um, this, this year I'm on sabbatical and I've been on sabbatical um, uh, happily spending m much of my time in two different institutions. One is this um, uh, school in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts that goes by three letters. And the other is a local elementary school. And I've been spending most Fridays in the first grade with one of the first grade teachers and several uh, days with the third graders. And after spending a couple of days with the first graders, and it's picking up on what you said, I'm getting to the question, spending a few days uh, with the first graders, they stopped asking me, so Mr. C, they called me Mr. C, which is kind of cool. Mr. C, what are we going to make today? They stopped asking that after the second day. 
and they started asking, what are we learning today? And I think when we look at the language that we use as learners and the language we use as educators, language we use as, 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 as advocates uh, for the arts uh, matters. And, and again, picking up on this notion of, of language, in that same elementary school, in most elementary schools I know in Pennsylvania and other places, the music, the art, um, the physical education teacher, they're specials. I think we should start calling them essentials, right? And that's why I use that phrase, the other core subjects, to talk about class, you know, spaces that are not the arts. So can we talk a little bit more about the language? In other words, what, maybe perhaps one of the reasons that the argument for the space and the position of the arts in society and education is so difficult is because of that language. And what do we need to do differently in addition to this you know, shifting language like you said, Eric, and you're in that way? Are there other ways we might change the conversation with policymakers, administrators, each other, our learners, our colleagues, um, through, through language to promote and, and, and change the conversation about the arts? Mm -hmm. So I may, maybe many people know, but across, across the country, there has been um, a lot of initiatives in terms of artists that take residence with municipal governments or the city. So it's not always socially engaged artists. There can be photographers. There can be pe people that work within clay. There can be dancers. There are individuals that work, uh, musicians with the police department to try to use art as a tool to um, introduce the police officers to, officers to a contemplative kind of meditative practice. So how that transforms their relationship to the public, what they learn through listening or playing music that changes them internally so they don't respond through uh, a, a trauma, mm -hmm. a trauma response in terms of the way they relate to the neighborhood. For me, I, I see that as answering your question about what is essential mm -hmm. about the creative process and its ability to transform kind of other places in our society. So when I think of, my origins were in clay making. When I first took an interest in art, um, it was through clay and through photography. But from there, I went through um, performance art, through feminist art practice, through now socially engaged practice. But the idea of the contemplative practice of clay, how that has the capacity to transform someone's experience to slow it down. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about essential and kind of being in contact with materials, who has access to that? These are the things I think about a lot in terms of what it may take to transform our society mm -hmm. and why art is essentially linked to that transformation. Uh, I, so I'm thinking about first graders and um, you know when we when we create these terms, these terminologies, they have a tendency to separate us as opposed to pulling us together. Yeah. And when we're when they're in elementary school, I don't think the focus is as much on now we're going to do this, now we're going to do this, now we're going to do this, as much as it is is we're going to learn, and it starts to get integrated. And then as the students get older, they're placed into a specific literal box, mm -hmm. a classroom, a box, and separating the subject matter. And then that creates a, sep a separate sort of attitude between those subject matters. Standardized testing, unfortunately, um, is separating it even further, putting placement on, on what's higher in terms of uh, a hierarchy of, of standards, standardized testing. The reason I think that it happens that way is because uh, something we talked about yesterday is this, this uh, idea of quantitative and qualitative measurement. Mm -hmm. You can put a Scantron in and you can get quantitative results. You, it's very difficult to do a Scantron of, of the arts. You know, I can't Scantron a performance. Mm -hmm. And I believe it, it's, David was, was mentioning yesterday, when you were talking about uh, the admissions group at your school, we understand the need for it. Um, we understand the reason for it. It just isn't always effective in the learning process. Right. It makes it easy, but easy isn't always better. You know, as I like to say, um, fair, you know, fair doesn't mean equal. So I, I believe that, that the reason we have this, um, you know, why we, we have these constraints is terminology. And you, you had said it yesterday, is changing the word, changing the simple word. And you said it in your syllabus, it wasn't don't 
bring your phone to class, but do bring your phone to class. Right. That's right. How do we switch that simple word mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and change it to um, a, a punishment into a reward? You know, the, the big one that they always say is, don't make your students write on the chalkboard a thousand times because then writing is a form of punishment. Mm -hmm. So how, how can we as educators create this do environment and, and bring it into uh, a togetherness? The more we separate, the, the more we isolate ourselves from the rest of the learning environment. I'm thinking about a bunch of I'm thinking about a bunch of different things. Uh, one of the I was really fortunate to teach at a, a, a junior high and high school before I started teaching at university just for a year, and one of the things that was really interesting it was it was an amazing school, and I learned more about teaching there than I think I had anywhere else. And uh, there was a moment where I realized I was teaching life drawing and setting up a ceramic studio, where I realized that. Uh, I wasn't necessarily just there to teach the students how to execute life drawings. Mm -hmm. uh, in one case, I think I may have been fortunate enough to facilitate this moment where a little 12-year-old boy realized he was funny, <laughs> you know, and that that was what he was in my class to learn. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, it makes me think a lot about, you know, this whole question of value how we place uh, value and where we place value. I think one of the things that's quite difficult is, is that um, so much of the language that we see nationally and through accreditation organizations and via institutions um, are really uh, forms of language that <coughs> ask for very specific articulation of value that uh, is about metrics and measurement and, frankly, capital. And that I would argue that the value of a university in a capitalist uh, society is its potential to resist uh, capitalism. And that the value of uh, art teaching in the spaces that are created, or, or that I at least hope to create or facilitate uh, in my studio, um, uh, have to do with their potential to create uh, spaces and learning and experiences that don't fall easily into a metric. Um, so I think that mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of coming back to the assessment monster here, and one of the things that I'm, that I'm thinking about institutionally is how do we, uh, uh, how, what does resistance look like mm -hmm. uh, in that context? Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, we could say, okay, let's get all of the schools together and we all refuse to do the report. Mm. Or we could articulate a leadership position and totally change the language in relationship to what assessment means mm -hmm. and what it looks like. Mm. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to do that, okay. but I think that we have to have those conversations. I, I have some ideas about what that could look like. Um, in, in, in some instances, that's already happening. Um, uh, through an organization called Policy Link that has been surveying the arts uh, and looking at the value of the arts and how it may transform policy. Um, so there's another opportunity that I am participating in through Arizona State University. I'm a um, community placemaking policy fellow. So I'm um, working with policymakers and artists and community members to flip the language about um, how we collect data, what questions we might need to ask. So. I'm inspired by the number of people that have assembled around the country to look at what equity looks like, what cultural equity looks like, what the value of art making in that process and uh, I think policy change or how it can be used to transform policy. So again, we aren't working alone. There are networks that we can become part of if we can have that interest in um, transforming the language uh, of um, I guess how we're collecting data about yeah. what people are learning. Yeah, and now, no, Erica, did you have something you to add? Um, well, you should pick up pick up the thread. If that's oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and I would just add. Um, you mentioned uh, Jules about collecting data, and it, for many people, they think data is just numbers, mm. and it's not. 
We collect data all, all the time. What is our data? What right? questions are we What is we our asking? data? Right? What yeah. questions do we ask? When do we ask them? And where? In a critique. We're collecting data. We install an exhibition. There's data on the walls. Look at the residue in your studios. That, that, I mean, we have data everywhere, the, the, the conversations that we have. right? So how do we document that data? How do we then organize or make sense of it? So thinking about data beyond numbers is quite important. It reminds me of a, a joke. I tell this quite often. A joke I learned. Uh, when I was in elementary school. Why did the little child put a ruler in her bed? I don't know, why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to see how long she slept. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. We take certain forms of measurement and apply them to other modes of, or uh, other sources of data. We're going to get absurd responses, things that don't fit in those boxes. And then they become special rather than essential. So I think the way in which we put our heads around notions of data, data mm -hmm. collection, data analysis is very important. Um, and uh, I just one more thing to pick up and then uh, pass it to Erica. Um, David, you mentioned um, you know, this notion of, of assessment. Um, and again, evaluation assessment is not the same thing, but um, one of the things that we did at, at Penn State in the School of Visual Arts is we talked to each other, faculty, about what is assessment? How are we assessing learning and, and student engagement and our own teaching? And among this list of, of, of qualities or characteristics, we said failure. Mm. Failure was an important part of the learning process for us. And if we can see moments of failure, but not just a moment of failure and let it go, it's that process. We've used process quite often today, not only in the making, but in the thinking, in the teaching, in the learning. Um, I think this notion of, of broadening and, and shifting that language of assessment is, is crucial. I really appreciate that comment. Yeah, Erica. So, uh, I was gonna mention this as like the other part of my life, but as you all were talking, I realized it's actually the same part of my life. So mm. uh, my graduate teaching at the University of Wisconsin is qualitative research methods. Mm. So I teach the introductory class, I also teach the field methods classes, and um, one of the core values that I try to instantiate, in the, and I draw, the, the intro class draws students from across the university, so I'm teaching it this semester, I have 42 students. Half a dozen of them are from the Master's in Public Health program. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are from the Second Language Acquisition program, folks from all across different education fields, um, some folks from environmental science. And so many of these people uh, come to this class with ideas about what research means mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and ideas about what data means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the ma my main goal for the class is for them to decouple research questions from methodology, nice. right? And nice. so they think about, for example, well, I'm gonna study the school to prison pipeline. And that means, you know, that I gotta get this secondary data source that looks at trends over time to understand, right? And, and so I start the class by showing, I'm actually now have a big thanks to HBO, um, can show selections of Anna DeVere Smith's new production, which is about, if, I don't know if you're familiar with Anna DeVere Smith as a performing artist, but she interviews folks um, in a sort of 360 view of a community and a, and a set of ideas. Her most famous piece is Fires in the Mirror, which was about um, the riots in LA in the 90s, as well as um, the riots in Brooklyn, about people's experiences. And then she herself embodies these real people in performances. And so, for my money, that's a research project. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and and the, her new piece is about the school to prison pipeline. Yeah, and so, we start by watching this piece, and then I say, is this research? Why or why not? Mm -hmm. um, with the idea that we are reconstructing what research is from the inquiry up, rather than from the methods down um, in order to, to understand that the act of researching is not an act of churning numbers through a oh, system. Right. There may be reasons to do oh, that, right? Mm -hmm. There may be questions that require this use of numbers as a way to demonstrate something, but that those are not necessarily the same. So I, that's a long way of saying I am with you on the sort of role of research and the and the reframing of research as an act of inquiry. Nice. Mm. Um, 
two other things I wanted to say about language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one, um, and this is like my own kind of pedagogical pro tip about language. Um, whenever I work with any kinds of learners, but particularly young people, um, I never use the language of rules, but rather agreements. agreements. Mm. And one of the reasons that I do that is I find that rules tend to have the word no in them a lot. Don't do this. No, you know, of course we don't want kids to fight, right, or swear at each other. But no fighting or swearing seems to me to be a fundamentally different communication than keep the peace, right, which is an agreement that we make. Um, in Wuppensacker, which I talked about last night, our first agreement that we make is that every idea is a good idea. And we talk about, like, what does it mean for every idea to be a good idea? And what does it mean to be in a space where every idea is a good idea? Um, kids are actually usually pretty down for that. Sometimes teachers are less down, and you have to work with folks to get them okay with the idea that that means a lot of fart jokes. <laughs> like, more fart jokes than most people are happy with. Um, but, but... Better the jokes than the actual performance of them. Sure, that too though, right? I mean, that's also funny to yeah. me. Um, but that by letting those ideas start the conversation, it allows young people to feel free to have other conversations. But if the rules are about what you can't do, mm -hmm. like what's the first thing they want to do? do it. The thing you can't do, do right? And so that's sort of a, my own kind of pedagogical pro tip around changing language, yes. right? Is, is thinking about, mm -hmm. like I, I thought of it when you said the thing about no phones, yeah, yeah. right? That like the, the way to reframe no phones, right? There's lots of ways that you could turn that into an agreement, right? Mm -hmm. Be, you know, be present in an analog space, for example, right? We make an agreement to be present in an analog space. Sure. And if that means no phones, great. Yep. If it means that there are folks who feel like they can be present in an analog space while still using a digital device to help them do something else, mm -hmm. you know, then that's something that, that you can work out with them. Yeah. Um, so that was one thing. And then one final thing that I thought of when you were talking about how assessment can look a lot of ways. Yes. Um, I'm very inspired by the Reggio Emilia philosophy, which is an early childhood kind of cousin to Montessori. They're also Italian. <laughs> um, they're not literally cousins. Oh, they probably are. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, the Reggio Emilia philosophy um, is a pedagogy that is focused on the role of arts inquiry in learning. Mm -hmm. And one of their core practices is documentation, mm -hmm. right? And documentation is kind of a fancy way of saying process as product. Um, mm -hmm. And in early childhood, it often looks like the teacher doing the documentation when kids are, you know, pre-fine um, motor mm -hmm. accessible, right? And so the teacher is often capturing what kids are saying orally, transcribing that into a process, right? Connecting it to the products that kids are making. As kids get older, they take over their ownership of their own mm -hmm. documentation. Um, and I find that that in my, I also teach um, arts integration for teacher education students. And so one of the methodologies that I teach is this documentation methodology, not because they're going to be art teachers, because most of them aren't, but to use this arts-based way of thinking of assessment as a core part of their teaching practice. Mm -hmm. To say, you can use documentation for almost anything, mm -hmm. if you're actually valuing the process as yeah. part of what people are learning, That's right? right? Mm -hmm. And you can use, and similarly with critique, you can use critique as a pedagogical practice, even if it's not a ceramics class, right? You can use critique in a science class, you can use critique in an English class. Mm -hmm. um, and so another way for me to change the language is to start thinking about how does what we know influence what happens in more traditional spaces mm -hmm. rather than trying to create more spaces for our own work. Mm -hmm. Not that we shouldn't be creating spaces for sure. our own work, mm -hmm. sure. but as a, as a way to um, engage more folks in yep. the stuff that we know is, mm -hmm. is impactful.
Exactly, and but the challenge I would say is to, again, going back to the instrumentalization, mm -hmm. to, to make that translation without placing the arts in that service mm -hmm. role again. And it's, it's a fine line, it's delicate, but if we think of it in terms of the pedagogical mm -hmm. moves, mm -hmm. I, I, think, um, I think we have some leeway there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have, a, I have numerous other questions that have emerged, but I, I wanna kind of return back to, so Erica, you just said something about reconstructing research and it made me think about reconstructing teaching, right? Your, your talk last night was oh. essentially this notion of reconstructing I only teaching. have one idea, you, so. You, you only had one idea? I said I only have one idea, oh, right? It. So it sort of comes up every yeah. time I talk about anything, that's like what there is. Well, I'm glad I picked up on your one idea. <laughs> how possible is, how possible is it what Erica proposed last night? Based on your own experiences teaching? Based on the, th the ways in which you've seen other folks mm -hmm. teach? How real? I mean, she, Eric, you showed us this amazing short statement about the sad little bush, yeah. and then it gets some water. We read this, right? Was it two and a half sentences long, right? And then we saw this performance, mm -hmm. and we had this, you know, Academy Award-winning video footage of it, right? Um, I mean, that's brilliant stuff. Every kid does that. Every single example does that. Every single moment in that educational space is as brilliant as that, and any teacher can take this on. With, with that level of success always, or, or not. What, how, how realistic is what Erica proposed last night in your experiences? Um, so again, the one um, class that I teach is uh, design in legal empowerment through the law school. So we make use of, um, I don't know, in our classroom, we open the classroom up to activists, to you know, other you know, groups. So again, I guess it's this sort of what co-design is in the legal environment, who we might include in problem solving, in coming up with, uh, let's I'll give you an example of, um, one of the projects we worked on was, uh, you know, lawyers are crazy, so we, <laughs> yeah, how do we um, assist um, a variety of people that do not have access to the law or self-representation or tenants? So we put together a course where we brought um, game designers, policy makers, judges, students, and looking at kind of the issues, brainstorming about the issues, and so not really having a solution, but trying to discover problems and trying to shape a tool or a process that might uh, provide some solution. So it's not like we knew what we were going to make or the set of questions that would arise, but we created an open enough space and invited enough people into that so we could think together and come up with solutions together to begin to prototype what a solution would look like, right? So it was, uh, we didn't have an idea, we had an issue that we wanted to address. And then we started to begin to form teams of who we might need to think of. I can't do it, a game designer can't do it, a theater artist can't do it, we may need a, a judge, we may need a, a policy maker, we need, we, know we, we need a bunch of students, uh, we may need to get some housing activists. We may need to find some people that are trying to solve uh, their own sort of tenant landlord issues together to understand what language we might need to craft this in or are there problems that we haven't noticed. So again, it's creating the open space and inviting people into it because we don't have the solution. We need to think about that uh, with others. So again, I think coming back to your talk, about how we might assemble teams and the knowledge, how it might be dispersed across discipline or um, even outside it, inviting government agencies in, inviting um, youth into that space. How can we create open enough spaces so we can do that work together? Mm -hmm. Because again, we have to unlearn and learn again, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So how do we create spaces so we're able to do that? That's kind of how I see my work in the institution um, that I work within, and there's, you know, we develop a team of people that want to do that together, is uh, how can we unlearn so we can learn again. Thanks. So I wanna paraphrase your question, is how realistic is this change possible? Yeah. And um, I wanted to make sure before I came to the convention that um, I was able to represent what I wanted to represent. It was really important for me to be uh, honest and sincere. And by fault or by 
uh, to my own fault. I think that's the biggest criticism I get as a teacher, sometimes good, sometimes bad. He's brutally honest. And, and I don't believe it to be any other way. And some kids respect that, and some kids don't really respond well to that, and you have to know your audience. Um, so I wanna make sure that I'm true to myself, but I also wanna be realistic in uh, my response. In this setting right here, right now, I think it's very possible. Mm -hmm. On the day-to-day -day basis of walking through the school, and I look at the faces of teachers that are just beaten up from the bureaucracy, I'm so concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm so, so concerned. Um, it's possible, but there has to be a willingness. And from administration to the day-to-day -day teaching, I think people are so burnt. And they, they don't want to approach a subject like this because it's so daunting. Mm -hmm. It requires serious change, not the surface change we're seeing. And we see so much surface change. Oh, we'll make, we'll make STEM. Oh, uh, project-based learning. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, project-based learning, as I said, was the same as what I was introduced to when I started teaching uh, 20, uh, 20 some odd years ago, which was interdisciplinary learning, and I thought that was the greatest idea. <laughs> I was so excited to teach because I was like, yes, real world. I, I thought this is great. And it, it, it's not reality, you know? So sitting here in the panel, and, and that's why I love it, and I said to my wife, I said, you know why I, I love conventions and things like that is because it energizes you with hope, and that stays with you for a little bit. <laughs> and then you get smacked in the head with reality. You know, and the reality is, is what I'm going to go back to, to my students who, there's a handful that I truly love that have taught me so much, and then there's the other. Mm. And someone taught me a while ago, there's the 33% rule. You know, 33% of your students you'll like, 33% eh, and the 33% uh-uh. And then there's the 1%, you know? And the 1% is what drives me those students that challenge me. And I'm so blessed, so blessed as a teacher that I've had them mm -hmm. and I continue to have them. That is such a rarity in life, yeah. not teaching, in life, mm -hmm. to find the 1% that can motivate you. So I wanna be true and real. I don't know how many of you are, are educators out there and I don't know how many of you are educators in um, public schools, right? But I know that for public school teaching, what you're going to go back to is the assessment monster, you know, the other class, the elective, you know. Oh, we'll just put you in an elective. Um, well, didn't you elect to be here? No, they threw me in here. Um, really? It's kind of odd, but okay. Um, and then understanding all of that to get it all done by at the same time making sure you create specific data for a handful of students so how much of my day is spent teaching my content and how much of it is just trying to help these kids navigate through life, mm -hmm. which really is the ultimate goal for me. Mm -hmm. I wanna help them navigate Absolutely. through life. Mm -hmm. If you get art out of it, bonus. Mm -hmm. A big, big bonus. Because, and, and I don't say this lightly, art saved my life. I didn't do art in high school. I was the kid who slipped through the crack. I was the kid who could not respond to any of the subject matters. And art wasn't introduced to me at that young age because it wasn't there. My parents didn't know anything about art. My teachers, you know, I was the kid that, oh, he's gonna be a failure, you know? And luckily I found, uh, um, luckily or fate, I found ceramics. And it turned my world around. And that's the only thing I wanna give back to these kids, the possible opportunity to see the world in a different way. And, 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 and yeah. I think that's where the, the hope is, is that it, providing those spaces of being able to provide a vision that looks somewhat different is better wow. than not being able to do that. Being able to point to something to show a possibility, even though you're in a pretty oppressive system, to say, actually, there's other models out there so to continue to point to those other models and ways of doing or ways of knowing, I think does provide that unique opportunity, right? Mm. I agree, Rather yeah. than not doing that. Yeah. yeah. And just, just really, sure, yeah, really quick. Sure, yeah, because I'd like to get yeah. into the, the Really quick, I just wanna, to, to piggyback on turning mistakes into opportunities. So I live in Wisconsin. I work at the University of Wisconsin in 2011. Um, the governor stripped public sector unions of um, all of their rights. <laughs> Uh, which was uh, devastating. 
but now seven years later, I think has become an opportunity. Um, and the reason I say that is as public educators, turns out if no one values what you do, it's a lot easier to do what you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the great opportunity that has emerged from the deprofessionalization of teaching, as heartbreaking as that is, is the opportunity to say, well, they think whatever we do is unvaluable, not valuable, so let's do it the way we want to do it. That's right. And that's what I see happening across the state of Wisconsin, mm. in urban schools, in tiny little rural schools, um, people looking around and going like, no, nobody's asking Nobody or looking? Mm -hmm. Great, <laughs> we're here for it. So, you know, at the, at the, at the risk of, of sounding like a Pollyanna, and after going through a pretty low period in, you know, having these rights stripped away from us, my hope is that that has turned into a way for public educators to gain back some of their agency just because they've been abandoned. Mm. Um, and the abandonment has the potential to let people, to set people free. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that that's true in all places and I'm not saying that like, we should abandon public sector unions across the country. That is not what I'm saying. It's being recorded, so I want to make sure that that's... <laughs> um, but that I see folks kind of doing this thing where they're looking around and realizing, ain't nobody watching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Uh, David, do you have something uh, to add? Uh, I'd like to move to the audience, but sure, I want to give you space to respond to the question as well. Uh, uh, well um, I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of things. I, I was, uh, I think initially, I was one of the things in, in terms of the video at the end, I was thinking just about the kind of, the power of agency. A little, little, little closer. I was thinking, uh, you know, that, that video, what, what I loved about that video, and, and going back to this question of like, how do we re, uh, how do we, we reconstruct teaching, uh, and how does that happen? Um, what I, what I was so, enthralled by in, in that video was is that the, the, the prompt was very, very direct, was e extremely simple mm -hmm. in, so, in so many ways, and then the response at face value is super simple. Mm -hmm. uh, but then its impact more broadly um, uh, uh, is incredibly potent. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think that so many of the, the things that sometimes we become encumbered by is, is how uh, complicated uh, we think things have to be yeah. in, order for, um, in order for agency to happen in the classroom. I think that um, sometimes, you know, just encouraging everyone around you to take the simplest first mm -hmm. step and to really trust that they have something to say. Um, we're not put into a situation in this culture quite often where uh, we're told that we have something to say and creating a space where um, we take the language of activism, community agreements grow out of uh, activism and we bring those things into the classroom and we think about how we can utilize that space to create greater agency for our students. Mm -hmm. All of those things feel like a way of restructuring education. Mm -hmm. But then one of the things we talked about yesterday that I think is important is this whole question of, uh, of how that's then scaled. Yep. So we were, one of the things that was really interesting about our conversation yesterday is like, okay, well, we can have this moment where no one's looking so we radically change what's happening inside the classroom. But then how do we make sure that that goes across the entire institution? How do we make sure that that goes outside of the institution? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that that, that there isn't, uh, that, that we can break the bubbles that, the kind, that, we, that we know that our students are gonna be able to move to the next class and be supported in the agency that they found in the previous class? Mm -hmm. At MICA, you know, we have an uh, incredibly collegial environment uh, where we have a, a um, really exciting, uh, um, people that are inspiring uh, uh, each of us all the time. But even in that context, you know, having a kind of uh, constantly addressing our institutional agreements and understanding what we're there to do together mm -hmm. so that we don't have this kind of silos forming yep. 
uh, I think is really important in terms of this question. I agree. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. So in terms of um, restructuring and uh, open conversation, let's open up uh, to the to the audience here. I uh, we ha I know we have two microphones, or at least we had two microphones. Are they still one? there? There's one right oh, there's one here. All right. So we have a microphone. Teach your voices. Great. We have a microphone here, and if you have a question, please approach the microphone. Uh, we have just under uh, 15 minutes. We have about 13 minutes left to uh, field questions. And uh, we will, if you could, uh, for the sake of inclusiveness, keep your questions as brief or direct as possible, and we'll get, the, maybe, maybe all of the panelists won't be able to respond, but we'll at least have as much of an exchange as possible. So first question. So my question is uh, really framed around uh, a quote by Emerson, when Emerson said that the secret to education is respecting your students. So the secret to education is respecting your students. How does a teacher show respect for their students in a deep way? It's a great question. Uh, I, I think um, meeting that student where they are at in their life experience, in the way they, meeting the students way, where they are at in their learning process, in their life process, in their growth process. You have to meet them there. But what does that mean, meeting? You have to meet them. How does that ma actually manifest itself in the classroom? Well, uh, you may not always understand where they're at, so I think uh, learning more, doing research about what they may be interested in, um, issues in their neighborhood. So again, learning more about them, learning with them, developing a dialogue, trying to understand more, asking questions. But I think in my, I may not always know uh, the experience that my students have been in, so sometimes I need to inform myself about and, and to do my own research so I can better communicate with my students. So again, it makes me be a learner, not a teacher. I am a learner, and mm -hmm. so there is something there um, through my connection with that individual that we, the work that we do together, right? So that's how I, how I look at what it means to meet a student or anybody where they might be. I, w I would say that, that the idea of respect is, is a mutual relationship so forming that mutual relationship is really important. And you have to break down the barrier. So you have to become extremely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. That is the most important thing, to be very vulnerable to your student. One, admitting you don't know all. Two, when it comes to the assessment monster, if you're evaluating another human being, you've already created a hierarchy. And that's a very, very difficult thing for um, anybody, adult, child, anyone to understand that um, how, how can you form respect? How can you create an environment of respect when you're judging another? And that's what uh, we, we have these terms, we're talking about language, assessment, judgment, evaluation. Um, when we learn to critique, I think that that's where that mutual respect starts to come from. When you have those informal or formal critiques, that's really where you start to see the vulnerability happen. And then you return to the making process. And then you return. So that cyclical, uh, period, which, which really is indicative of ceramics, um, the cycle, allows you to build that mutual respect with your students. I see there are uh, four, thanks for that question. I see there are four other people, um, we'll do this, maybe not everyone will get a chance to respond directly. Yes, please, with your okay. question. So I'm wondering if any of the panelists have some strategies for implementing that kind of new idea of having improv, but the practicality of having to get through the school day and plan out your materials and what you have to set out, and how do you get off of that train of making stuff, but still learning in that kind of improv improvisational kind of way? One, one quick idea that I have um, is to think about the learning process in a longer trajectory. So I think we get into trouble when we think of day by day. And I think a lot of that is because not everybody's gonna engage in the process in the same way at the same time. Mm. And so I think to give a little more freedom in terms of when and how people, students engage in a process 
can be a way for them to feel freed up from the tyranny of time, um, and maybe for you to feel freed up from the tyranny of time, knowing that you have to get somewhere, right? But rather than thinking of getting somewhere tomorrow, thinking of getting somewhere in nine weeks, right? So that's just a quick kind of practical tip that I, that I like. I, I think uh, just echoing, um, again, just finding, finding ways to integrate that type of thinking, the improvisational sort of method or model into your everyday, uh, if you're in a classroom, I'm not sure you know, what, what, where you work or what that environment looks like, but making a space for it, even mm -hmm. to kind of ritualistic set up a space where you do that action, you do that thing every day in your classroom, right? So mm -hmm. it actually starts maybe slowly transforming the way we think about it, the way, you know, so maybe we don't even have to make that time consciously anymore, it's just there. So carving out, where is that space where we can have that freedom in our classrooms or anywhere in our workplace? David, do you have something to say real quick? Yeah, a very quick comment, the, uh, and this isn't, this isn't necessarily uh, um, always easy or practical, but one of the th uh, people I was lucky to work with at the Waring School is a woman named Isla Sahai Proudy. And she was the kind of teacher who, halfway through a life drawing lesson or an art lesson, if she realized that people didn't understand uh, some analogy that she made to jump, jumping rope, she would take the whole class outside and spend time jumping mm -hmm. rope. I think that like the flexibility uh, that we can bring to a classroom to turn direction based upon um, this whole idea of all knowledge is accrued on other knowledge. Like we have to sort of understand what people know and, and what maybe the class space is actually for uh, in a way that we don't expect it to. And that also requires that, that we're given that flexibility uh, that we can um, bring everyone outside uh, and jump rope, as well as that we get funding for the rope, uh, as well as et cetera, et cetera. Thanks. Thank All right, thanks for your question. All right, next. Yep, I see we have four um, questions and uh, probably six minutes, so let's see what we can do. Um, my question is how to broach these changes towards the academic educators and the administrators and potential school boards. And is this film going to be available to those of us who want to go and start being the thorn in the school board side? So, so Josh, is this film going to be available for uh, uh, others to view? Okay, so the response was it should be up on the Enseca YouTube channel sometime after the conference. Thank you. And Great. how, any ideas how to broach this with those groups of the academic world in public education? Uh, again, I think, um, you know, I'm uh, finding sort of people across the country that want to do this work. So going to those places, I mean, like this, this conference, finding your people, finding your network of people that are doing that work, and then um, I, or that's how it's worked for me. I, I'm, this is my first time at this conference. Now I want to I want to come back, but I participate in many, many communities that I feel that are, are linked. So uh, that process for me has sort of expanded my network in a variety of different ways. Um, so I think that's what I'm trying to say is, uh, find your people that want to do that work with you. Great. Thanks for your question. I just want to make sure other folks get a chance to respond. I just want to use a little bit of a hackneyed phrase around that, which is better forgiveness than permission. Mm -hmm. Just start doing it, and then people are going to go, wow, what's happening in that room? Absolutely. Yes. Hi. I'm wondering how you create a sense of intrinsic motivation with your students to get them to want to create, and even colleagues, too, how you get them to not be okay with being complacent in education? Be awesome. That's it. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, your awesomeness will make them want to be more awesome. I know that sounds overly simplistic, but telling people to be awesome often doesn't work. Mm, no. Being awesome yourself gets them to think, well, you can do that? Yeah. Great, I'm doing that too. I, I agree, yeah. Uh, real quick, I would just say, to jump back, a couple 
questions ago is time. You know, time is, is not the same for every student. Embrace the individual person. And, and what's gonna, ha you know, I was fortunate to work with some great teachers and something that Chris Staley told me a long, long time ago, which I try to live by, is this concept of slow time. Mm. You know, how do we get them, how do we stop, stop, and just wait? That pause is deadly for some people, that silence. Somebody might have that, what you deem as, in, as, as laziness or what you deem as unmotivated, it might be a nine week period. You know, I'd hate to leave eight weeks and <coughs> six days before. Right. You know, so we don't, we don't we, in the academic world, in the school, and, and especially in the high school, we deem the motivated student as the kid that's taking all the AP courses with an A. Sometimes I deem the motivated kid that's got C's and D's and is just showing up. Next question. So these are the last two questions. Okay, yeah. hi. Um, my question is if anyone would like to address this um, on the panel, is how do you or how should we include our communities in the planning and evaluation processes of our programming? Because that I've been at this for a long time now and it still seems to get kind of thrown under the bus is this idea of first graders planning their, their curriculum or people from communities um, actually having their needs translated into programming. Um, it, it just always, like I said, it always is like, oh, well, we don't have time for that. We have these other things to do. And to me, though, it's always been a way of my thinking of who do I work with as opposed, and it changes the dynamic into who do I work for? And so if any of you could address ways that we might be able to do more of that or ways that you're doing that, it'd be great, thanks. Okay. There, there's, some great, there's some great writing on what's called participatory design methodology. <laughs> and I find particularly, I think your question is a little bit about how do you get funders to acknowledge that the planning is part of the residency or the process. So I find if you stick in words like participatory design methodology, <laughs> it allows you to incorporate the planning into the project rather than the planning as the thing that happens before you do the project. So we're under a minute. I want to uh, honor this question, but also um, certainly we can take these questions um, outside uh, and respond, have a conversation afterward. Um, so last question, please. And, and this could totally be taken outside. My name's Erin, I'm from Seattle. I hope to see some of you next week there um, for the National Art Education Conference. I'm, I'm curious, Steve, about what you're gonna do after this year to help promote more teachers from ivory tower institutions to get into public schools. And, and I would like to help be a part of that. Okay, great. So part of what I'm going to do real quickly is continue to write, I'll continue to write my uh, research, so I'll write about my experiences, I'll give talks about it, but I'll also invite my colleagues to come visit me and uh, work with folks like you who are interested in, in continuing this work. You got to keep doing it. Mm. You just have to keep doing it. Yeah, so thank you. I want to thank our panel, uh, Erica and David and uh, John and Jules for your time and for your thoughts and your experiences and your willingness to improvise and collaborate uh, together. It's been a thrill. Um, in less than 24 hours, I think we've put something together that's pretty special.